Hi everyone, so my name is Amy and we're in a series called Spiritual Royale, which is about how to arm yourself against spiritual rulers, powers and authorities uh, in the battle arena for your soul. Uh, the passage we're going through is Ephesians 6, more specifically Ephesians 6, 14a. So this is about the armor of God. It says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, when we think of armor, we definitely don't think of belts, right? But if we were part of the audience of that day, we would know that Paul is referencing gladiator armor or uh, Roman armor. Now, commentaries say that it was this thick black belt that you would put around your waist and there would be leather strips that would dangle from it to protect your lower abdomen. You would also be able to put your sword in it and it would also secure other pieces of armor in place. So essentially, if you had no belt, your lower abdomen would be exposed, you would have no place to put your sword and your armor would be falling off. So the belt was pretty essential. So it held all the armor together and it secured it to the soldier. Now the text compares this belt to truth. So truth is essential. Um, it's a part of your spiritual armory. It holds the pieces of spiritual armor together and it secures it to you as a believer. Now the word for truth in this text can refer to absolute truth or ultimate truth. Truth here refers to the reality of things in relation to God. So people's fundamental identity and value is given by God. So what this text is essentially saying is that this kind of truth we need to buckle round our waist, this truth that is defined by God. But we do have a problem, right? We're caught in the middle of this spiritual battle against Satan who is the father of lies. So he's going to do what it takes to make sure that we do not have truth in our spiritual armory. So let us think, what is the world telling us about truth? They're saying that absolute truth or objective truth doesn't exist and that you're actually bigoted if you think that. It's also saying, they also say that truth is relative, subjective, person dependent. It's created by your society and it's always changing. So we are being taught in high schools and universities and by the media, this form of relativism or postmodernism when it comes to truth. So let me summarize this. Number one, culture says you must define your own truth, your own identity and your own uh, value, or that culture will do that for you. Your culture, your context, your society will determine what is true, what is valuable and who you are. Now let's tackle point one says that we must define our own truth. We're going to look at something called the Jahari window. So it's essentially a table concerning self-deception and self-insight. So in the first quadrant, we can see open self. So this is stuff that we know about ourselves and others know about us too. And then there is the hidden self, stuff that we know about ourselves, but other people don't know. This would be secrets or uh, unexpressed thoughts or feelings. But then you get that quadrant called the blind self. This is stuff that uh, other people see about us, but we don't see ourselves. Uh, I have a humorous story about this actually from high school. Um, I did drama in high school and I was reading this monologue and I thought, wow, I really can relate to this person. Sure. Um, and essentially, I thought she was a control freak. And then it dawned on me, wow, maybe I'm a control freak because I can relate to her. And then I turned to my friend and I was like, hey, can I sometimes be a control freak? And she was like, yeah. <laughs> so it was, that was part of my hidden self. I didn't know that this was something that I struggled with, but everyone else around me could see. But then there's that fourth quadrant called the unknown self. This is stuff that others do not know about me and things that, we, uh, that I don't know about myself. So this is completely unknown. But what the Jahari window shows us is that others' knowledge is limited. And it shows us that our knowledge is limited, so much so that there is a whole chunk of knowledge that we don't know about others and that others don't know about us. So my question to you is, do you think your definition of truth is actually accurate? Especially that we've just described and discussed the Johari window where we can see that we don't really know ourselves and others don't know us. And my second question to you is, are you willing to stake your life on your own limited knowledge. Because remember, we're in a spiritual battle against the father of lies who will do what it takes to make sure that you take off that belt of truth and leave yourself vulnerable.
Let's tackle the second point. The world says that no, your culture, your context, your society will define what is true. Now, I don't have to tell anyone that society is notoriously cruel. Like, I don't have to say very much about that at all. You know, it's rife with racism, gender-based violence, child abuse, rape, murder, corruption, poverty, war. And, and this is not a new thing. <laughs> this stuff started in Genesis. We, we read about murder and, and rape and incest and all these horrible things right from Genesis. So society is broken now and it was broken even back then. The irony is society is also made up of individuals just like us. And we've just seen with the Johari window that you and me don't have a great understanding of each other or ourselves. So do you really think that society's definition of truth is accurate? And my second question to you is, are you willing to stake your life on that? Because like I mentioned before, we are in a spiritual battle with, against Satan, who is the, the father of lies, who will do what it takes for you to take that belt of truth off and leave yourself vulnerable. Ravi Zacharias uh, was a Christian apologist, and he gave this analogy to reflect what it would be like living in a world of relative truth. So I know some of you are about to get your learner's license. Maybe some of you already have your learners. Maybe some of you have your drivers. So I don't know yet how, if you have experienced this, but it's definitely happened to me. So you, you pull up to the robot and you stop because it's red and you're just waiting for it to go green. And then you have this like sudden moment of realization. You're like, I think my car is rolling and you have a little panic moment. But what you do is you look outside the window to a stationary point of reference, like a building. And then you can see, oh, yes, I'm rolling and I'm going to crash into the car behind me, or no, I'm not rolling. And what Ravi Zacharias says is living in a world of relative truth with no reference point would be like trying to figure out if your car is rolling when the buildings move. Relative truth leaves you not knowing where you are in relation to the world and in relation to others. It's like trying to live on quicksand. But you may then ask, but Amy, okay, my alternative is absolute truth, but where do I go to find absolute truth? Who, who can I rely on to give me that? Then I would say to you, if someone was omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, like present everywhere all the time, and omnibenevolent, all-loving, could you trust that person to give you absolute truth? Could that truth be relied on? And I would say, yes, it can, because this person would know everything, be everywhere, and be all loving. But not only does scripture describe God this way in all the ways that I've just mentioned, it also describes all three persons of God in relation to truth. It says God the Father is the one true God. It says Jesus, Jesus calls himself or says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the Holy Spirit is described as the Spirit of truth. It even says that God cannot lie. So I believe that you can trust God and you can trust what he says. Um, and God has revealed what he says through scripture in the Bible. And I do believe that every word is true. I know that's not a popular opinion, but I know that if you do struggle with this, this is a bit of a side note. If you struggle with this, I would encourage you to go look up Ravi Zacharias or Sean McDowell or Lee Strobel on YouTube and go and look what they have to say about Biblia, uh, yeah, biblical Christianity and if it's true and not. So that's my side note to you if that's something that you're struggling with. But the reason why I believe that, that God is who he says he is, is not only an intellectual thing, it's also experiential. I've experienced God as all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful, <laughs> all-present. I've experienced him as profoundly patient and merciful and gracious and kind to me. I've experienced him as a mighty savior, but also as a best friend. If you have not tasted and seen that the Lord is good, my suggestion would be to go to God and say to him, I need you to reveal yourself to me. Or say to him, God, would you make my heart soft? Like I did. I had to in, in 2013 say to God, I have, a, I have a, like a rock for a heart, a heart of stone. Would you make it soft? And he did. About a year later, but he did. <laughs> if you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, then dear brother, sister in Christ, 
Stand firm with a belt of truth buckled around your waist. Thank you for listening. Cool, cool. <laughs>